Good day, folks. This is Shane Hasty. Uh, for a change, I'm on the other side of the mic, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising podcast. Greetings, and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I'm your host, Jay Hersko. And for this week's special guest, uh, we have another podcast host. Some of you may have read the Stephen King book on writing, where he talks about writing. I, on the other hand, got another podcast host to talk about on podcasting. And with me, I have uh, our guest this week, Mr. Shane Hasty. Shane, thank you for joining us. Jay, thank you very much for having me. The pleasure is truly, the pleasure is truly all mine. So Shane, uh, for people who may not know you or know of your work, could you give us a, a, a quick bio? Um, Uh, who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, As you mentioned, I'm the host of the InfoQ Engineering Culture Podcast. And uh, in the InfoQ community, I lead the culture and methods team. I tell the world that that's my hobby. (laughs) Um, Then my day job, I'm the Director of Community Development for IC Agile, the International Consortium for Agile. And there, look after the the community of instructors and member organizations and certification holders under IC Agile. Um, background, ooh, I can now say nearly 40 years in information technology of one sort or another. Um, many, many decades ago, I did program in Assembler and COBOL. That's when I started. Uh, <laughs> Which is still kicking around. COBOL and COBOL 2 are still kicking around. It's still kicking around. And I discovered to my to my horror that I can still read a hex dump a little while ago. <laughs> uh, I don't want to have to do it, but uh, <laughs> I could. Um, and yeah, many years uh, in development, in project management, in team leadership, uh, and 15 years as a professional trainer, trying to to bring across the ideas, all the mistakes that I made, and, and pointing people to how not to, what not to do, <laughs> I think, more than anything else, um, and been involved in what we call Agile since early 2002. So you've been there since since day one, um, and you've been in IT even that much longer. So let me ask you this, Shane: um, How did you? How did it come about? You are the host of the of the of the InfoQ podcast, the Culture and Methods podcast. Well, I got involved with InfoQ in two thousand and eight, where when I wrote an article, I um, was passionate about the intersection, the overlap of agile and business analysis and um, put forward an article proposal that was accepted. So I wrote that and it felt good. Um, And I just (laughs) reached out to them and said, hey, what else? Is there anything else? And there was an opening at the time for somebody to just write news. And InfoQ is a news consolidator. The one way we, we describe ourselves as InfoQ journalists is information Robin Hoods. We're out there finding things and bringing them to the community. So the stuff that might not be easy to find, we're looking for and stealing from the rich and giving to, to, the, <laughs> to the rest of us, so to speak. Um, and the, And it just it aligned with my personal values it it was it was fun i got to to meet interesting people and uh, when did we start with the podcast it must be probably around about the same time as as agile uprising about five years ago we started yep yep we we, uh there was should we do a podcast was a was a question and we did a couple of episodes to see whether people would be interested. That seemed to get uh, quite good traction. And then it just became a thing. And we've now got it down uh, one episode a week. And, and it initially it was one a month. And then we got to one a fortnight. And now it's uh, it a steady progress and flow of one a week. 
it, you've you've worked out like, much like we uh, we can probably share that we've worked out all the kinks to the point where now it kind of just runs itself, which is a kind of nice place to be. Uh, yeah. Not to say that that ever makes it any easier or it no. ever makes it any less <laughs> exciting. Um, so, yeah. sh- well, I-, I have to tell you, Shane, um, your voice is what actually cued me into the podcast the first time because I was scrolling through InfoQ, right, and I, on my podcast app, and I downloaded an episode, and your voice came on, and instantaneously, I'm like, this guy sounds like the smartest college professor I've ever heard in my life. And, and I don't know if it's the accent or whatever, but I, I, I thought to myself, this is someone who should be telling me what I should be paying attention to. <laughs> and that, that's how I ended up becoming a fan. Um, and, and you. you know, you bring up an interesting point where you said, you know, we were, you and InfoQ were finding all these things and you were searching for this, these ideas, these ways of thinking, ways of working, and then bringing it out to the audience. And, and I do think that there is a, um, there is a, a space for that type of curation because, I mean, if you go onto Amazon and type Agile in the book section, you're going to be yeah. completely overwhelmed. And it does help to have someone who's helping you, helping guide your, your journey through that path, because there's, there is so much content out there. Um, It's hard to actually even get your hands around it to try and figure it out. Yep. So let me ask you this, Shane, when, when Mm -hmm. you started getting into the podcasting gig, you know, what do you think was in hindsight, what was the hardest part about becoming a podcast host or doing this podcast hosting? What do you think was the hardest part? That's a good question. Um, what was hard? Getting, figuring out the tools and technology. I'm, I'm an extrovert. It was easy to have conversations um, through my work with the Agile Alliance, through my day job at the time, which was with SoftEd, and and through the news writing and article curation on InfoQ, we had I had the contacts, so mm-hmm. it was easy to to reach out and find people to talk uh, to talk with. Um, and they, on the whole, if you if you invite somebody, um, most people are, are keen to talk. They've got they've got a story to tell. So getting guests is not too difficult. Coordinating time zones for me is sometimes <laughs> That's a the challenge. Part. <laughs> yeah, the because I, the I'm based in yeah. New Zealand and, <laughs> and finding finding an overlap time that works. Uh, I have done podcast recordings at 2 a.m. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> not, yeah, I am, not my yep. favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you have to, you know, you have to, people don't realize you have to get up early. You know, if you're recording at two, you basically are up at one thirty. You got to have a yep. cup of coffee. You got to wake yourself up. Um, yep. I've had some. I think uh, a Mark Burgess when we interviewed him about Promise Theory, that was like first thing in the morning. I think it was like four a.m. our time. Um, and then I got to give a shout out. Uh, getting a credit where credit is due. Jorgen Hesselberg in Norway. Um, I thought it was a good, it was a good time for me, but apparently it was like 3 a.m. for him. He was like hiding in a corner of his house with the lights off. Um, but it was, a, but you're right. It, people don't realize how the work that goes into the sausage, right? How the sausage is actually made. Um, yep. Let me ask you this, Shane, you know, you've been doing this quite a long time. What are, what are some of the episodes, some of the interviews that you've had that stand out to you that, that when you think back, you say, Man, that was really a hell of a conversation. I, I I hope to have that energy every time I interview somebody. Doug Kirkpatrick on organizational design, talking about the way that um, Morningstar runs and the the self managing organization organization with with no managers. Uh, I'm passionate about uh, business agility the uh, extension of the ideas of agility into other parts of the organization so seeing organizations where they've done this really well and so doug was doug definitely stands out Uh, another one richard sheridan Um, i was privileged to spend a week with menlo innovations i did their their deep dive um series of of training courses but also got to spend time you know with looking at the teams watching work happening um talking to to richard and to james getting a a feel again for how that organization runs uh johanna rothman always inspiring 
she's a great guest. She really is. We could yes. probably call her right now and she would probably conference in. And, and yeah, and she it. would just jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, just, uh, again, a wonderfully generous person, wise beyond belief. Um, Linda Rising, one of my, you know, a, a couple of really great conversations with her and such a forgiving person. Um, one time we were at uh, at one of the agile conferences and it was nine o'clock at night we were sitting down she we recorded a, a whole episode and i forgot to hit the record button on the recorder <laughs> i was my next question was going to be have you ever had like a disaster and well, yep. i guess that covers it yep <laughs> that was that was it and uh, and linda kindly redid that conversation with me um one of the this one didn't end up being a podcast, but it were it ended up a, a great a couple of articles I wrote um, at the Agile Singapore conference. Now was it 2014, 2016, somewhere uh, around there? Um, it was actually the first time I heard Richard talk. He was giving uh, a keynote talking about Menlo, and on the, the night after the conference, Richard and Linda Rising and myself were, were still there in Singapore. So the three of us went to dinner and I put a, an audio recorder in the middle of the table and they interviewed each other. It was just oh, such awesome. a beautiful thing to happen. Um, I turned that into an article that's on, on InfoQ and it was just, uh, just a wonderfully serendipitous thing. We then spent the next day having a great time wandering around the uh, the gardens in Singapore as well. So that's one of the things I can't wait for travel to come back. It's those like you use the perfect perfect serendipitous encounters where you just have a couple of people who end up having a conversation, and that conversation turns into gold you weren't even looking for. Those are those are the types of of run ins and encounters that I, I think we all miss, you know, over the last 18, 24 months. So let me ask you this, Shane, um, as someone who's consistently on the prowl for new content, as someone who does a lot of interviews and, and meets a lot of people, I mean, not just for the podcast, right? And your stuff with InfoQ, but with IC Agile as well. Um, we've so many trends, so many ideas, you know, practices, principles, frameworks, and procedures uh, come and go. Um, what's, what's one of the trends that you've come across or one of the Agile practices, methodologies, you know, what have you that really has surprised you, uh, meaning that you, you, when you first heard about it, when you first dug into it, you were like, eh, I don't, I'm not sure if this is gonna, this is gonna resonate, and it actually has. What's one of those things where it really took you by surprise? Hmm. Well, real psychological safety. Okay. Psych safety was a thing, and it was a buzzword. And we see lots and lots of organizations, lots and lots of people standing up and, and talking about how, how important psychological safety is. But when you, when you see the organization, when you see the people in action, it's not there. Mm -hmm. But every, every now and again, you'll come across uh, a place, a team, a person where it genuinely is there and it just stands out. And if we think of the last year, the another thing that's been really important is the focus on wellness, on, on um, self-care. Mm -hmm. Because as we've been through... Uh, spates of lockdowns and dealing with all of the um, the really hard aspects of this of this pandemic the the recognition of the importance of that self-care of the the psychological safety of the the mental health of people in our industry because mm -hmm. for a long time there's been burnout and it, and it's been sort of brushed under the carpet right right ignored covered up oh don't worry about yeah. it you know don't yeah. you know you'll be okay yeah 
Yeah. And we, you know, one of the, the core principles of the Agile Manifesto is sustainable pace. But I don't know of a single Agile coach who manages that for themselves. <laughs> You're right. We are the worst, you know, practicing what we preach. We're the worst yeah. at it. Yep. Yeah. So the, the, the people stuff, which was core to the thinking of the manifesto, but has got lost in the mechanism, in the mechanics, I think. Right, right. It, it just got, it, it was quietly, and I don't even think it was purposefully. It just kind of got consumed by some of the other, um, some of the other practices because it's, it's kind of a hard sell, you know, true psychological safety. That's, yeah. you're, you know, refactoring, you're, re you're rewiring yourself, your own personality, yeah. let alone corporate culture. Um, yeah. And you you make a, a great point about the idea of mental health. I read a I read a white paper um, halfway I think it was halfway through the lockdown, and I've I've beaten this quote to death because I really think it's it's uh, relevant. And the quote was, "Mental health is not just the lack of a diagnosed mental illness." And I think that was a really powerful quote for me because it made me think about, like you said, it caused this for whatever we just went through. It caused a lot of people to take a step back and take an assessment. And, mm -hmm. and just saying, well, I'm mentally healthy. Well, I am not diagnosed as clinically depressive, or I am not diagnosed as obsessive compulsive. Well, that doesn't mean you're necessarily mentally healthy. Those two things are not necessarily equal. And I think the acknowledgement that mental health is, is just as if not more important than physical health. I'm kind of hoping that was a, a good thing that comes out of this. I don't know. I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I, I'm with you there on the cautious optimism. I think that some of these changes, you know, there's, there's the big shift to remote work is okay. There's the, there is that genuine checking in with people. Are you okay? Mm -hmm. And meaning it. So if the, if we can sustain those behaviors, uh, when we, once a year on InfoQ, we do a trend report. Um, and the, one of the key things in end of 2019, we had remote work as, as a trend that was sort of in the early adopter. A lot of people <laughs> were, were starting to do it. Of course, through 2020, it became late majority, but we've, we've dis deliberately distinguished between what we've called good remote work and bad remote work. And sadly, the late majority, the, the vast majority of organizations are doing remote badly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's, you mean sitting in a Zoom meeting for eight hours with my camera on so you know that I'm here. That's not good remote work, Shane. That's not good remote work. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, and there's there's been a lot of stuff published and a lot of research coming out of, you know, what it needs and it, and it's not that difficult you know, mm -mm. just schedule time be flexible build trust in and again we come back to that real psychological safety um i came across an article i think it was earlier this morning it was in forbes where they were talking about um studies show that most remote workers are taking naps, having sex, watching TV, and working on a side business. And I read that article and I thought to myself, I must be doing this remote work thing wrong because none of those four things are happening to me. <laughs> so if somebody could hook me up with that job, I would really appreciate it. My first name, my last name at gmail.com. Um, but, but I think you're right. I think there is, a, there is, a, def, there is a, a very strong line between working well from home and not working well. And, yeah. you know, the people, the poor people who were crunched over their kitchen table for yeah. however long, you know, is sitting at a, at a, at a kitchen chair. They are not meant to be sat at at length. I don't yeah. care. You know, especially if you're not like having a dinner party, they're not meant to be sat there long enough. And there is, there does need to be some sort of acknowledgement that there is a right and wrong way to do it. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Shane, hmm. in regards to trends. Um, obviously you've, you've, been around for quite a while in the agile space for 20 years, IT 20 years longer. What is one of the trends that didn't stick that you're really surprised? Something that you came across where you said, I think this is a really interesting idea. I think more people should know about it. And then for whatever reason, it just never took off like you thought it would. 
Jim Highsmith's work on adaptive software development. Okay. Jim's book that, you know, he was one of the, the authors of the manifesto. He was right there at the beginning and his structure, his, his advice on um, doing the little bit just enough upfront work and so forth. And all of his ideas, now I think they've permeated into other areas, but it was actually a brand. There was a thing called adaptive software development. Mm -hmm. It got lost inside Scrum or, or with the, the Scrum behemoth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, also, you know, Alistair's stuff on Crystal. It the, still holds up. It still holds up very still, well. They, yeah, all of these things still hold up and they're, they're really powerful, but you don't hear much about them. Right. Yeah. That was one of the, I know a lot of Agilists take umbrage, with, they're going to take umbrage with what I say, mm -hmm. um, but there is that, there was the subcar map, subway map written by mm -hmm. Chris something on something over in Deloitte. And yep, I yeah. really loved that thing. I really did. Because up until when I saw that, I had never seen anyone take the vacuum cleaner approach to all the practices, methodologies, things you can do inside of the agile space and try and lay it out in a way that you can kind of understand it. Mm. I mean, I personally found four or five things I wasn't, I'd never heard of that I don't, went down the rabbit hole. And I, I do wish there was something like that that was modernized i mean i should try and find that guy and get on the show and ask him you know how much is it going to take for you to do the, the 2022 update but yeah. i do think there is a benefit to that there because like you said there is so much out there unfortunately things just get they just get lost yeah so um back to the show shane let me ask you this as far as um the InfoQ podcast, Culture and Methods. Who mm -hmm. is your white whale guest? Who's the guest you haven't had on yet that if you could wave a magic wand, they would show up tomorrow, be fully prepared, and you'd have a really great engaging show? Hmm. Frederick Lalu. Okay. Okay. Reinventing organizations. All right. Yeah. I want to go deep into teal. And what does it really take? That would really be an interesting conversation because mm. that, that book is very dense. It's a great read, but mm. it's very, very dense. It's, um, yeah, it, it's a hard read, but a great read. Yeah, I, I, I've made the joke on previous shows that I, I, I'd like to find his editor in a dark alleyway and have some strong, <laughs> strong words um, because I actually think they built the book backwards. You know, he leads off with all these fantastic examples, but there's no theory behind it yet. So he goes through, um, what is it, Bundesorg and mm -hmm. uh, Butzorg and Morningstar and all these companies, all the manufacturing companies. Yep. And he gives all these great examples. And then at the end of the book, he's laying out the theory. Well, mm -hmm. whereas me personally, I, I personally would have liked it either flip-flopped or the way that um, uh, Jurgen Apollo did Management 3.0, where every chapter is theory, application, yep. theory, application. Where I there's think a that, story weaving through. Yes, and, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, that, to me, just cognitively, that would have been a... A better story. Mm. So uh, I'm going to ask you, Shane, the same question again. But if you're, it doesn't have to be an agile person. Who would be your white whale guest if you could just ring up anybody living and say, "I want you to come on the show," and they would come on? Who would you? Who would you line up? Simon Sinek. Really? Mm. Hmm. He Stop does have to. Why? I, I do. I've, I've watched almost all the stuff he's done on, on yeah. uh, YouTube. He's a, he's a really, really bright guy. I, the Leaders Eat Last is a great book. Mm. So I'm going to pivot the conversation a little bit, Jane, and we're going to talk mm -hmm. about Agile as a practice in and of itself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we've reached the 20-year mark, right? We're officially mm -hmm. going into our early 20s, where I don't know how your early 20s were. Mine were a haze of bad decision-making, <laughs> trying to stay out of jail, trying to stay employed, right? Student loans and whatnot. Um, yeah. Agile has come of age. So where do you think it's going? Are, well, are we going to see a massive disruption? Are we going to see some, I mean, Kondratiev curves and Carlotta Perez's work, right? So obviously there's something yeah. coming behind it. Where is the Agile world going now? Taking these ideas and meshing them with the ideas that are coming out of other thought areas around 
true organizational transformation. So the, the buzzword phrase is business agility. But it's, <laughs> right. it's, it's agility, it's, thin agility. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, agile in marketing. It's agile in finance. It's, it's agile in strategy. Uh, it's the work that Evan Laybourne is doing in the Business Agility Institute. It's mm-hmm. the, uh, the the true transformation of the world of work. Uh, so creating... that's that's where you think we're headed. <sighs> that's where I hope we're headed. <laughs> That's where Shane the Optimist thinks we're headed. Shane, that's where Shane the Optimist wants us to go. That, that, <laughs> that's, why, that's why my day job is with IC Agile. If you, if you look at what IC Agile has been doing lately, there's been a lot of stuff coming out around this business agility space because we as an organization firmly believe that this can make a difference in the world. And I think at the 20 year mark, it's proven to have longevity, right? It's not this. That's it. It's not yeah, the flash it, in the pan, new great thing. It really has yeah. shown to have grown some legs. And yeah. while, I mean, I think it's, I, I don't think it's a secret to say there's a lot of companies that have struggled along their journey, but I do think that the the theory is sound and it's proven to work. It just takes, I, I think the thing that everybody loses, mm. mo- most people lose is the fact mm. that it takes time. You can't rush yeah. this type of change. You know, you're talking yeah. about, you know, psychological safety, true organizational agility, right? Even like trying to get to a teal type state it's not something you do overnight no yeah it's and the journey itself needs to be incremental so um i've done work with organizations across the spectrum and and with some that were started as incredibly uh predictive sequential command and control you spend some time with in the organization and you make a shift the the shift on the overall spectrum if you if you take i don't know a traditional telecoms organization at one end and menlo innovations at the other and if you're working down at that 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 uh, traditional end the shift might be small. It might be a 5% shift. But for the people in that business, that 5% is life-changing. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. You know, what was, I forget the book that said that when you're, when you're looking at behavioral cultural shifts, at, at 5% of the population practicing the, quote, new way, that's officially become embedded, right? That yeah. is something that's not leaving. And then at 20%, it becomes unstoppable because at that point, you reach, you've reached an infection point where it just tips over. Yeah. And, and just making a difference in people's lives. I, it, it, now I've, been, I've been in the field for four, for four decades, so I'm obviously not a youngster anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and making a difference in people's lives is what matters to me. And I think a- agile practices approaches philosophies bring that out i i I would i dare say that my listeners uh, the listeners and myself would be hard pressed to disagree with you i do think there's a reason why many of us have glommed on to this idea um and you can you can tell you know not to not to lay bones bare of of some you know some of the skeletons in our organiz- our our practices closet but you can tell when someone's into it because it's a way to buy a boat and you can mm-hmm. tell when someone's into it because they truly do believe that this is this is a better way of working with each other and if those if those people could reach the 20% point we'd really be up a, we'd really be up for a tear i mean you know, mm. which lead, which leads to my next question. So we've talked about agile, where agility is going. Where is where is technology going? Right. I mean, I, I'm assuming I'm assuming you you follow everything that's going on in this crazy world, stuff like artificial intelligence and machine learning and and you know blockchain and all that sort of stuff. Where do, where do you think we're headed, Shane? What's going to be the next thing? You, any ideas about what's going to be the next thing that really just makes everybody go whoa? Is it going to be quantum computing? Is it going to be fully autonomous cars? What do you think? <laughs> I, 
it, there's going to be something in in the AI machine learning space that is going to truly make the the, the huge difference. You know, whether it's roboticization and but I think we we sit also at a huge level of risk, and this is the the societal aspects. You know, the the ethics the biases that are getting built into the ai learning models for instance um, the inequalities in the application and in the in in the benefit uh, so yeah we with ai and robotics we can remove a lot of the drudge work for for thousands for millions of people what are we giving them in its stead um yes yes very very valid point very valid point uh, the I... floyd marionescu the uh, founder of infoq has been a, a strong advocate for universal basic income and has done a lot of work in in canada on that space uh, because he too, or he, he really has been inspirational in saying, you know, technology is doing this for us. How do we make sure we do it? It's doing it for everyone. Right. Not just for the small, the five owners of the, or the 1% right. or whatever privileged minority you want to call it. Right. And I am... I am apt to agree with you. Um, you know, UBI here in the States is kind of treated as this goofy sort of communist, you know, oh, we're going to pay people not to work idea. And what really changed my mind is I recently finished the book by Kirkpatrick Sale, Rebels Against the Future, mm -hmm. which is all about the history of the Luddites and, and their uprising in the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, we're taught this thing in school and you're taught these, these people didn't like technology and they smashed the weaving looms, right? Well, the, the, the deeper story of that is it's not that they smashed the weaving loons because they didn't like technology. That was part of it. The other part of it is getting at exactly what you're talking about with the rise of technology. Their culture, their way of life was completely upended. There was complete upheaval. And, you know, history doesn't repeat it often rhymes, but you would think that looking at that and looking at how these massive changes on, on, on what to us, to us looks like this rudimentary type of technology right? The, the loom, really? Steam engine? That's a big deal. Um, we should be cognizant of the future and make, make the world better for everybody, not just a privileged few. And, I, and yeah. that book, I mean, he's a granted, you know, neo-Luddite. I, I think I want to do a, a podcast where we just argue about technology. We call it the Luddite show. Um, <laughs> but I, I think he makes a lot of valid points in this book. And this book was written in 95. So yeah. it's before the computers became a thing. And even then he was talking about how um, automation and modernization. It's not, um, it's not something done for you or with you. It's done to you. And that's mm -hmm. one of those things we really need to be cognizant of. Yeah. So a uh, couple last questions for you, Shane. Um, mm -hmm. I love to ask this of people. Um, what are you, what are you reading? What are you currently reading right now? What am I reading right now? Well, right now I'm busy, uh, going through professional coach training. So the Coactive Coaching book has been my bedside reading for the last few weeks. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm you know, doing a 21-week transformational coaching program uh, with a view to getting the ICF uh, certification. Excuse me, I'll... No worries. I need uh... hello. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Hey, no worries. I, you can do wonders <laughs> of post. You know this. Okay, so you were saying yeah. coactive coaching. You're working on a um a yep. multi week so, course. What else? I'm I'm attending a 21 week uh, coactive coaching or transformational coaching program, and that's been yeah. Uh, 
deeply in, deeply enlightening. We recently had one of the exercises because, as a coach, you're going to ask people to do this for themselves. Is uh, deeply examine your values, and it's been, it's been really interesting to okay sit down and say okay what are my values what are the things that that drive me so there's that is and books around that are things i've been i've been looking at a lot lately um just because this is a a, a place in my in my personal growth journey that i i want to be able to step into again helping others as a right. as a, a professional coach Right, you, you need to be aware of yourself before you can actually be aware of others, right? It's, it's you know, change change comes from within and all those those tried and true lines. Um, mm. And last question for you, Shane, what are mm. what are some of the things you, you're you reading, some of the content you're consuming that you think other people should be paying attention to? What, what are things that, uh, websites, blogs, anything that, that you think, hey, you might want to pay attention to this because there's some real brilliance coming out of this space? Mm. Well... I'm going to go back to Menlo Innovations. They they have a great newsletter. They have a um, Richard's two books, the uh, Joy Incorporated and his latest one, Chief Joy Officer. Absolutely inspirational. How do you? What do you need to do to create an environment where people get that deep satisfaction, the joy of a job well done working with people that you care about and the the other thing that um, menlo have done is they've, they've really um because of the pandemic of course they they've had to shift to remote work and it was a hard shift because philosophically everything about that organization was you know the the in-person elements mm -hmm. and in the blog they've they've traced that journey and how they've how they've adapted and it's a great example of of how organizations can adapt and evolve to the remote work and different ways of working and still have that strong humanistic people focused underpinning oh i definitely need to need to come across that and then start passing it out because that's one of the biggest isn't it with Work is oh, and how does this high touch, high fidelity, interacting culture? And it sounds like they they found a way through and they made it work. And this is a yeah. uh, this isn't a fly by the seat of your pants type company. Like they're that name, you know, Menlo Innovations. I mean, if you don't know what that is, you got to be crazy. You'd be living under a rock, right? So that <laughs> that definitely proves that there is there is a way to make all this work. Yeah, Perfect. and and it was the deliberate, careful design. And how do they incorporate, how do they bring in the people factors? You know, they still do all work in pairs. I love, I love pair working. That's awesome. I really yeah. got to dig into that. You know, you talk about deliberate design. It makes you think of, I, I got a chance to interview Jardina London, and she talks about how you should always design for change. And I thought that was a really powerful way to put it. And I've, I've used that liberally because a lot of times we have this, and it's a human thing where we have this false expectation. I get to do it once. I don't ever have to do it again. Whereas, you know, change is constant. And the one thing that Changes. is constant in our lives is something is always going to be changing and something is always going to be going wrong. So you might as well just make peace with it. Absolutely. So um, I know we're we're running up on time, Shane. Your your day is starting. My day is ending. Uh, but I wanted to I wanted to give a chance to if if user if listeners of the show, fans of the show, they want to come, they want to find you, they want to reach out, they want to follow your podcast, um, they want to uh, read some of the things you're reading. Where do where do they find you? How do they find the show? How do they get how do they get in touch? Well, um, Shane at infoq.com is the email, and. It's that simple. Um, I'm on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter as at Shane Hasty, all one word. Uh, you can find me there anytime. Um, and yeah, just infoq.com. And the podcast is always on the landing page, on the homepage. 
Awesome. Awesome. Um, on behalf of myself, Shane, and my listeners, I want to thank you for, for coming on. This has been a really fun conversation. I know it must have been kind of weird being on the other end um, of the microphone and being the one, for lack of a better term, interrogated, but you were, you were a, hell of a, a hell of a sport. So thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of Shane and myself, I want to thank all of you listeners for tuning in once again. Um, if this is your first time listening, please give us a review, a rating, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, your podcasting app of choice. It does help others find us. Uh, we have a Discord server, which is quite outgoing and rambunctious lately. We've had a lot of really good conversation. So we'll be chatting about this episode, some of the content that Shane mentioned. Um, I believe Coactive Coaching did come up in a previous thread, so I got to do some digging. But if you're looking to get more involved in the dialogue, um, I believe it's discord.agileuprising.com or something of that like. It'll be in the show notes. Um, and lastly, I want to give a shout out to Machine Man Records and the artist Krebs who graciously provided us with our outro music. Uh, so now YouTube doesn't automatically take our episodes down for copyright infringement. So once again, I want to thank all of you for listening. Shane, I want to thank you for joining us. And until next time, this is the Agile Uprising podcast signing out. <laughs>